Um, okay, so I guess I'm going to kick this off a little bit. Uh, really lovely to, to be here and thank you so much for asking me. Um, I am sure like everybody were exhausted talking about the parameters of COVID and what how they do and don't affect things. But we are where we are. <laughs> we're having a Zoom conversation to celebrate your uh, extraordinary show and congratulations and, and to think a little bit collectively about your practices and to reflect on the exhibition. And again, I, I feel like I'm repeating what Matt Packer did last year when he talked so eloquently about those first moments of COVID and how it impacts on exhibitions and how it impacts on our expectations as artists in relation to interaction and either the intimacy of engaging with work particularly, or maybe it suits your work better, or maybe it's triggered a kind of different direction. We're a year into this kind of extraordinary pandemic. And presumably, again, this video will become an archive of sorts um, that will record the extraordinary conditions we're in. So, um, yeah, I mean, I hope I hope one wouldn't want to drag in COVID or the circumstance unless it's relevant. Um, uh, and at least we're announcing and understanding that it is conditioning how we're talking together instead of walking through the spaces and actually seeing the physical works. Uh, but it, I think in, in the back of our mind, certainly from, from, from running uh, Emma, um, yeah, of course, we're trying to see what, what this has triggered, what, what great things and what disastrous things this, this phenomenon has triggered and, and what kind of creativity or not uh, it has triggered. So I'm happy if it's relevant to you uh, to include uh, these kind of conversations, but otherwise uh, I don't think we necessarily need to rehearse them. But I mean, it is a, an extraordinary potential moment, of course. Um, so to that end, I really do want to congratulate you all and um, uh, remark on the fact that it is significant. This is the second year in which uh, a kind of a remote engagement with uh, this this project um, is happening or this this kind of uh, moment in in your own careers where you get to display these kind of extraordinary projects. Um, and yet it's interesting that two years on the focus of the window, the understanding of our our perambulations through art on the street, our engagement as audiences in this very kind of boxed off, isolated way um, is very real and and happening for a longer time. Um, and so I think it's also just interesting to remark on how you have worked with that uh, in relation to the final production of your practice um, in this situation. So what, before we go into each individual uh, work and artist and, and discuss uh, what you've chosen to present today, I think I would love to ask you about your title. Uh, th this project is called uh, Reluctant Mirage. Um, so I wonder, would you guys fill me in a little bit on, on how you concluded this as a collective title? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that the title really was born out of the conversations that we had as a group in the lead up to the exhibition. Um, and then Brendan Fox and myself took it on ourselves to write the text surrounding the exhibition. And through some conversations, we kind of I struck upon the idea of a mirage and how it's something unattainable and it's so desirable and covetable, but it's completely false. And it seemed to speak to the conditions that we've been trying to work in and trying to be creative in over the last year. Um, yeah, Brendan, do you want to continue on with that? Yeah, I suppose um, as well, it was very much to do with this notion of longing as well, both from a psychological perspective and then obviously from a physical perspective because of the because of the restrictions. Um, and I suppose we were also looking at the idea from an educational perspective that the goalposts were being changed a lot. You know, that the, the, our notion of time had become um, uh, very, I suppose, you know, had com completely out, out of sync from what we would normally experience, how we would normally experience time. And um, I suppose a lot of those elements combined, um, it felt like kind of an apt uh, way of describing um, what we were trying to achieve. If Even if under the, under the restrictions, it couldn't have happened again, it would have, um, it would have still survived somehow online, but. No, absolutely. Thank you. And I love this. I mean, there is that lovely sort of um, tension in the title about this idea, of course, of reluctance and yet this this impetus to be kind of to imagine or the mirage. 
Um, and yet we are simply corralled into this kind of crazy situation. So I think it's a really nice. Does anybody else have a comment or a query or a point to make about the title and your its encapsulation of all of your practice? Yeah, I think I can add to the reluctant mirrors worked really well as an idea we were all struggling with and it's this kind of like reduction of the everyday life or like to our like intimacy and like right by like moments so it was like this kind of like longing as well to go like beyond that I guess yeah okay and also the idea of of us collectively coming back together again but only virtually after being together for two years and working together and then sort of dispersing and doing our own thing and yet having to come together virtually to put on a show that actually was quite challenging um, and I'm sure sort of fed into the thoughts for the for the actual title. And also way. bizarre right I mean at some point we have to acknowledge the bizarre <laughs> the, the, this situation is bizarre you know in, in relation to how we would have conducted practice before so yeah. Yeah. The virtual aspect of that was definitely a big instigator for the thinking around the idea of the mirage. Um, a, a mirage being a distortion of perspective and a dis distortion of light and how you perceive it. Um, and considering the conditions we've been living in for the last year, I think everything's really been distorted in our perception of how we live and how life has been before and whatever it might be in the future is completely skewed. Absolutely. So thank you for that. And thanks for giving us such a, yeah, an imaginative envelope in which we can kind of discuss all the work. Okay, uh, so I think we're gonna stick to the order in which um, this has been suggested. And uh, I'd love to talk to you, Aoife, in particular about your work, uh, Druid or Drift, as I understand, 2021. Super, great. Um, so I'll just give a quick little introduction to myself. Um, so I'm a multidisciplinary artist, researcher, and curator based in Dublin. Um, my main points of research over the last couple of years, particularly in ACW, I've been looking at affect, affect theory, queer theory, and decolonial approaches to research and practice. Um, and my work more or less manifests as sculptural, relational, and curatorial queeration, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, so my practice in the last year or two has um, explored effective interpersonal and socio-political relations and ways in which we can resist against oppressive structures and hegemonies. Um, my master's thesis, um, Affect and Trauma in Contemporary Visual Art, was the culmination of these past few years of research into tangible and intangible remnants of colonialism in contemporary Ireland and the tran transgenerational trauma that's present in our culture. So the project that was born almost as a sidelines to my thesis research, because my thesis was very much entirely written um, due to COVID circumstances. I would have preferred a more physical output, but um, Dree Door Rift was born out of that. And it began as a curiosity as to how you can uncover the hidden histories that are very much present in our day to day lives, but they go unspoken or unseen. So essentially it was trying to make sense as to how to make an effectual interaction or relationship, which is something that is invisible, but leaves traces behind how to make that visible and tangible. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. So Dree Door Drift is an ongoing project examining the etchings of colonialism that remain embedded within contemporary Ireland. Ireland's landscape has been carved out by glacial movements, drift and sediment that have left its mark upon the earth. Rigid coastlines, erratic midland eskers and hidden mountain micro valleys across the land are contemporary monuments that stand as a testament to how water in its many forms has shaped our landscape. The work presented in A Reluctant Mirage um, is just actually a still image captured from a short film that I'm currently working on for Driadar Drift. Uh, this moment is captured in time, emitting no sound or movement, a flowing succession of stimuli stilled. And I felt it was fitting to, portray, er, to display this particular still as it's a very heavily edited image of the valley walls um, from the valley that first instigated my interest into the research of the geomorphology of Ireland's landscape. Um, can I? There we go. So this is actually just some images of the micro valley called the Glen in Sligo um, that instigated my research interests 
in the glacial drift that has shaped Ireland's landscape. Um, so for the first stage of Dreedar Drift, which is predominantly research um, based, um, but I had one lovely collaboration with Kate Friedeberg, also an ACW student. Um, and over the course of the months between March and July, we collaborated on um, a project which was to be a soundscape. She created a sound installation. So she created a sonic response um, to the, the ideas of the geomorphology of glacial sculpting, change and loss, which is evidenced in the markations on the walls of the Glen, um, which is a forested micro valley carved by a particularly destructive glacier eons ago and is now hidden in the crevices of Knocknarray Mountain. Um, so this sound installation was presented as a socially distanced public event in July 2020 in the Glen in Sligo. And I'll just play a little minute of that for you. Um, if you have headphones, it might be nicer with headphones. Um, I don't, I'm afraid, but not no, <laughs> no problem. Um, so let me know if the sound is coming through for you. I'll just play. That's working for you there, is it? Yeah. That's great. Okay, so I'll just skip ahead to one part. I'll play about a minute of it. Um, so it was shot at night time um, in the lashings of rain, which I think added to the ambience. <laughs> sharing there so yeah just a little section of that um sound installation that we did to give great point and uh yeah i think i'll leave it at there really so <laughs> okay awesome thank you so much um i guess a uh, few few questions and queries i mean i think it's a really quite a sumptuous image um and the sound is really interesting i suppose i'm very interested in the idea of how you're thinking politically about the idea of time and the epoch. I think it's very interesting to understand also your thinking around the idea of the planetary and colonialism, because I absolutely agree, of course. I mean, um, on every level, it's interesting to understand how the planet is marked by power, uh, which sounds like it is something that you're interested in. But I don't necessarily quite understand the relationship in the image or the sound to the idea of colonialism. So I'm, I'm just wondering about this idea of the glacial. Um, it, you could talk about it as a kind of a natural literary marking of the land. Is that what you're getting at? Or is there another way in which you want to think about the idea of, uh, of, of, of the colonial? Yeah, absolutely. So I think using the idea of glacial drift and its effects on land on the landscape over the last um, thousands of years, it's a nice sort of stand in for the psychic effects um, and the soci socio political effects of colonialism that are still very much present in modern day, particularly in Ireland. Um, I did a lot of research into um, the ways in which women were women were conditioned, I suppose, to British polite senses um, in the 17 and 1800s um, and the view of Irish men as being barbaric and the kind of ideologies that were present around what Irish people were um, acted like and how they were um, and how then, you know, people that, uh, or that was, I suppose, changed in um, 
many violent and not so violent ways. Um, so yeah, the, the I suppose the psychic um, and the the psychic effects of it. So the the idea of a kind of a, a psychic sort of marking or in, incremental sort of um, invasion of the land or a marking of the planet. Uh, interesting. I suppose I'm just very curious about where that might go because obviously. Uh, one could talk about human behavior, but one could talk about the planetary, you know, I mean, uh, there's so many exciting thinkers right now who are really trying to understand uh, the idea of the material and the non-material, um, um, you know, um, in relation to a whole idea that is, the, yeah, I guess, um, not count, co counter modernity, but just trying to expand a certain idea of the understanding of the lived and the unlived. Um, so I'm curious about where this might go in relation to a very kind of, um, you know, I mean, the issue sometimes in Ireland is that there's such a romance about the landscape. So it's quite yeah, interesting okay. to understand how do you if if the interest is deeply political, how do you enunciate that in a, in a way or where do you see your way forward in relation to that kind of a project? Yeah, that's an interesting point, actually, because something that can be quite beautiful does hold a history that is actually quite violent and has many different stories to tell, apart from just the aesthetic value of it. Mm -hmm. um, and having having worked and researched in uh, the area of uh, looking at uh, systemic oppression and how systems of power can cause um, so many different ripple effects and things that go unspoken or unseen, um, I suppose it's the where I would see it going is down the line of more contemporary iterations and what's happening right now that's less tangible so not necessarily in the landscape itself mm. but in the socio-cultural landscape um things that can be addressed and need to be spoken of more yeah I wouldn't let go of the landscape though I mean I think there's people like uh, Beth Povanelli um, obviously Donna Haraway's more recent work but where they're actually looking at the idea of the non-animate and the planetary as a way of exploring not only geological time and all of those kind of ideas, but actually a response to what we produce as people and a way of that talking back. So there's something quite interesting there. I think there's a whole a whole wealth of knowledge and, and kind of engagement. So, I, I mean, your aesthetic sort of engagement with the with the image of the land is not something I would let go. I would just be interested to see where you might push it in relation to something that could look quite abstract and your deep political interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to pushing that a bit more, particularly with film, because I haven't worked in that before. So it's a yeah. nice way to actually be able to create um, when you're isolated in a shared house. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really great. OK, I think we're going to... Uh, head on to the next Can I ask a quick question Aziza oh, of course please do um it's just um oh I have the headphones in sorry I'll just use them for now um yeah there's a line in my film where there's a segment of John Moriarty and he uses a line from Haldane which is um the universe is not only queerer than we suppose but queerer than we can suppose and he corrects himself to say he means the old meaning of queer but I'm just wondering in context of the queeratorial and that does that statement have any meaning for you does it lose its meaning if it goes back to the old definition rather than the modern definition? Fantastic question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I really like that, uh, Shannon. Um, I that was one of the most poignant points of your film for me, actually, because I thought that was an excellent, excellent quote and uh, something that really goes again into the um, queer phenomenology that's influenced and inspired a lot of my work and the way that I view the world and the way that I um, produce my work. Um, I think that there is a third meaning and it's probably a more contemporary meaning and it's a conjoinment of those two. So there's the old understanding of queer mixed with the new understanding of queer as sexual sexuality or queer as um, a, a gender identity. And um, I think that the merging of those is something that's happening a lot in visual culture and aesthetic theory and, I, and critical theory as well. Um, and I really like the last 15 years Sarah Ahmed and many other fantastic theorists who've kind of merged those two together to mean not necessarily sexuality in and of itself but then how a person who identifies as queer due to their sexuality or gender identity how they then view the world in a very queer way that really has nothing to do with their own identity but how 
their experience in the world has caused them to um, view the world um, from a queer perspective. Completely. It's, it's a whole methodology. It's a set of intellectual inquiries. It's a it's a potential for world revolution. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm doing horrible on time, so I'm going to have to get uh, much better at um, trying to be more succinct, but I actually really value the idea that you could ask each other questions. So thank you for that. Uh, Maria, I think you're next up. Is that OK? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Annie, for having this conversation with us today. I'm going to like briefly introduce myself and like maybe like briefly introduce the work I'm achieving in in Product and Mirage as well. So I'm an artist based in Dublin. And yeah, after completing my MFA, Art in the Contemporary World, I'm now like for the developing my art practice. I also have a background in restoration of cultural heritage and in music studies as well. Um, my practice usually involves mapping techniques like sound recording, photo documentation, and trips both to the digital and the physical worlds with which I look for ways to inhabit and untangle the heavy body of policy, regulations and conventions that surround the urban landscapes I engage with. Um, I usually bring these elements then into my working space or my studio space. And then I try to reassemble them looking for new spatial possibilities by its recombination and speculation. Um, in fact, I think my practice engage the space as the primordial element for the production of my work. And I think this is something very key for the final projects I did for this MFA degree. Uh, this project, which is named The Zone, exhibited, is exhibited in a reluctant mirage, um, taking the shape of a map and a QR code a installation around Dublin city. Um, the zone is actually located in a Google Drive folder and then the QR codes around the Dublin city can give access to like some locations of this folder. And um, although the zone stands a close relationship to those locations where the QR codes can be found, I don't like to think about it as a site specific work but rather as an experiment on orientation and disorientation within the landscapes of our like surveillance, capitalism, realities and systems. So yeah, as I said, the, system, the access to the zone is gained through these QR codes and I like them um, to be as this entrance to the zone because I think they prepare the visitor for this kind of like vision and perception that the whole project um, stands because I think they are like great artifact, like while giving access to like somewhere beyond, like to this digital realm, they also block like human sites and they like force um, people to kind of like depend even more like on our like phone devices. So I think I'm gonna share my screen now and maybe show you some images. There we go. Can you see my screen there? It looks like it's screen sharing now. Yeah, it's just come up now. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So these are some images of the QR codes around Dublin. They are like six in five locations. These are the NCAG Gallery, the Dublin Docklands, Grand Canal Dock, the Bay of Sutton near Hove, and the industrial states in Clonsnaw. So for example, this could be the access to the zone in Clonsnaw. And they are like set here in the entrance of these industrial estates. Um, this could be, for example, some images that give access to the zone in Grand Canal Dock, for example. So all these places um, have also like a strong relationship with the internet infrastructure of Dublin City. And I think um, these locations are a great example of the complexity of our like urban landscapes nowadays, because like they hide these positions they actually like a stand, like looking at these kind of like pure systems. And yeah, as I said, I usually like to give access to the zone through the QR codes, but like for like making it easier today here in this chat, I'm just gonna show around a bit um, the Google Drive folder. So this could be how the zone actually looks. It has six 
sound files, six images, and six texts, different texts. And all of them stand a relationship based on the different stages of a virus infection. Um, I use this kind of like metaphor of the virus as a way to kind of like give a bit of a structure to all the materials I engage, but they don't necessarily need to follow this over. So just to show a bit maybe the visuals of the zone, I'm gonna like share these, which are the actually, yeah, the actual six GIF images that kind of like entangle the visuals of the zone. And they refer to these places I was talking about, the Dublin, the Dublin Grand Canal, mm -hmm. um, some of the transatlantic fiber optic cables that connect the internet infrastructure. And also like another like examples of the architecture and the kind of like a space, a spatial system around Dublin city. So quick question, the sound files and, and the images, do they come up automatically or does one have to select when you use your QR code? So some of the QR codes, um, like it's straight away linked to like some of the, for example, like sound files and in other QR codes, the visitor actually like have to choose what to listen to and like how to actually like combine all these elements. There we go. So I think I'm just going to show a bit. Uh, well, I don't think that's going to be possible today. But yeah, like this could be like the six different sounds there. I'm not sure if you have the chance to listen to them. I thought they would repro uh, reproduce here, but like it's OK. And this could be like just a quick look at the text that they follow these stages of the virus, as I talk about. And they kind of like play with this metaphor of the language as a virus as well. And they stand this kind of like weird relationship with the material history of the places they are talking about, in which it's not really clear which is a speculative and which is not. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I'm gonna leave it there. For... Thank you, thank you so much. I think um, it sounds like the pandemic suited you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's a, an extraordinary and really interesting uh, navigation of 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 um, of space beyond beyond uh, any kind of exhibitionary space in the in the classic sense, and a very sophisticated understanding of how we're actually, um, yeah, of course, uh, receiving ideas and information, plus hyper conscious at a level we possibly never were before about the outside. Mm -hmm. Were all those spaces uh, specifically to be outside? Was there a sense of wanting to be inside or was it very much reflecting on this kind of pandemic moment of what one would come on in relation to a kind of sense of publicness? Um, so I'd say it's like a bit of both because I actually like um, started my engagement with this space before the pandemic and then the pandemic like happens mm -hmm. so like, to kind of like change uh, the focus of the projects. Mm -hmm. Because for me it was like really important to be kind of like coherent to the moment we were living at that stage. Mm -hmm. And what I actually intended was kind of like bringing these real spaces and real locations to kind of like another level of speculation, maybe like to be able to raise new questions about um, what can be done actually within our like everyday spaces and which is the scope of action left to like people living in their cities. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. There's something really interesting about the aesthetic of the QR code and the datedness of it and the recuperation of it. Uh, so I'm very interested in your decisions around its use we started to use it again, even though it felt like the last time I'd even looked at a QR code was in 2008 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it was it's really interesting, the idea of its of, of your your need for an immediacy. Yeah. And, and urgency in, in relation. So are you somebody who and this is just to, to try and understand the kind of critical nature of the practice um, are you embracing things like that because they are literally current and of the moment? Is there a kind of a need to kind of resonate on the very real uh, presence of the moment uh, in your practice? Or was there a certain attraction to the QR code because it's kind of some interesting phenomenon right now? I think it would be much more the second reason you gave there because, well, first of all, the material history of the QR codes is really interesting. They're kind of like hairs of the barcodes and they firstly like appear of like kind of like an open source uh, medium for everyone to use. And then they kind of like started like being um, commercialized in the markets. And I was really interested 
tips in this idea of like common knowledge available online and which are like the things that can be like augmented through the internet. And I also think they are like really interesting as objects that while like being in the physical world, because like we print the QR codes for them to be in like specific locations, they are not images that belong to our kind of mm. like physical realm again. They are not, not images for us to be seen, they're like images for something else to look at them and to decode their meaning. And I think it's really key for us now to think about our sensibilities and how our modes of thinking are changing because of the interference of these new technologies. And I was like really interested idea, really interested in this idea of like how side ambition is changing because of these kind of like objects, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. One last quick question, and that is in relation to globality. I mean, obviously, we're thinking about the digital and the the possibility of no, uh, negotiating these kind of terrains. And I'm just interested in whether where the practice might draw you now. You know, um, is it is it located always within your own kind of context? Because just the the QR code, if you would understand its development in somewhere like China. Is so radically uh, um, relevant in a very different way than it has been recuperated here. So is there an interest in the idea of the developments of the kind of technologies and where that might lead you as a principal set of the work? Or is the work more about the idea of the, the public terrain? I say it's more interesting about the idea of the public terrain. Yeah, I'm like personally really interested about um, how anyone can reflect and think about these kind of issues from very kind of like amateur point of view so to speak mm -hmm. so yeah I'd, I'd say the second yeah okay I suppose my my reaction would be think about the first two because there's an you you clearly have a very uh, smart instinct about how to work with this mm -hmm. um, and there's such incredible developments to even track the movements of them in relation to their implication could be something extraordinarily rich yeah definitely yeah and also like in regards of the fiber optic structures like that cross the ocean and so on there's like great work to be in a complete in that field yeah. as well so yeah and just to understand that these kind of technologies are very cha challenging the literal material of what we might understand as public space as well mm -hmm. yeah. thank you so much that was really interesting I am so enjoying this moment of being able to just talk about artwork with all of you. It's really extraordinary. Dominic, um, unless somebody else has a question. Just, just a comment um, in relation to a question you had at the beginning of Maria's um, and, you know, the outside space mm. um, and whether that was intentional. I mean, the fact that Maria concentrates on, on these virtual zones, they're, they're not imaginary. They're very real. They're just very intangible. Real. And yeah. there are these geographies that we need that she helps us to consider. And that I think is, you know, an important consideration as well. Yeah, I think it's extraordinary. And I actually think that's exactly where we need to track the idea of what what technology and, and geography are doing. Mm -hmm. So to understand a notion of a generic public space is actually perhaps quite a naive category. <laughs> there's yeah. there's much bigger implications to all of this that I think um, you'd be well able to delve into. It be, could be quite exciting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I actually was really interested in developing this kind of like a speculative and like fictional place about these specific locations within Dublin, because I found that the actual implications were really complex and were like even like at some point, like even like out of our reach to really like understand the consequences and how these kind of like infrastructures really tangle us together in these systems and like making this fictional space where I can really control the rules, so to speak, like kind of like gave me the freedom to think about them and like maybe like raise new questions about them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. OK, Dominic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the Anthropocene and um, listening to Aoife at the beginning. I mean, I can I can see quite a few parallels in in our treatment of the idea of the Anthropocene. And, and I particularly love the idea of the glacier and the idea of, of very deep time coming into our present in a very slow way. Uh, it's very poetic um, and something that 
reminds me of, of um, some of the readings I did for the Anthropocene and during the MFA, um, people um, like Elizabeth de Locri and uh, Daniel uh, Ferrier, who wrote a book called Anthropocene Poetics, looking at the poem. But, uh, I'm mainly a painter. Um, and during the two years of the MFA, I tried to, um, I suppose, take myself out of my comfort zone very much and uh, um, apply my new um, ideas that I was developing and reading through, um, through the MFA and ACW to the interest I have in the environment. And I sort of came to realize that rather than being literal and, and painting eco art, I really wanted to interrogate the Anthropocene and, and map, map the Anthropocene and specifically look at sort of some of the underlying and fundamental reasons behind it. And, um, and then looking at um, the sort of post-humanism as a, as a means of thinking a way out of it. Um, so maybe I should just maybe bring up some of my sure. ideas and talk yeah. through them rather than talk before it. So I'm, I'm going to do a screen share if I can. Um, one sec. So this is the, one of the paintings I have. Are you still there, everybody? Yeah, yeah, oh. we're all here. Yeah. Um, I'll just make that big. Um, this is all um, one of the paintings I have in, in the show. I don't mm -hmm. know whether you've seen it, Annie. It's called Plantation of Scene, and it, it's about looking at one of the causes of the Anthropocene, which, as we know, is about this sort of indelible layer of human activity which has been laid down in deep time to be measured in the future, just as we measure the Jurassic or any of the other sort of epoch type layers. Um, and I, I really wanted to look at ways of painting it. Um, and I, I decided, I, I sort of came upon the idea of, of painting the scenes as a way of actually manifesting um, the ideas of this mapping process. And that uses Donna Haraway's idea of, of making these new names for these different scenes as capital, she's not the only one, obviously, capital scene, plastic um, plantation scene, um, I made a new one, zoonosis um, and then chuthulocene after the sort of chuthulic sort of melding of creatures. Um, so this one is plantation of scene and it's set in, in the, the National Gallery in, in, in Dublin, which is our, which is, which is a location of, of um, sort of colonialism, of plantation, as, as are nearly all museum. Um, but it's also about nature. So it was for me a very, very useful um, reference point, a visual reference point. And obviously these animals are dead and they've been dead for a very long time. So that's another, another thing. And they're, they're preserved in, often in resin, which is something else that really appeals to me. So, so from, for many, for many uh, reasons, um, putting um, a painting of the, the museum uh, into the show was quite important. Mm. Um, I also added facial recognition squares into this. And in a lot of my paintings, I've, I wanted to talk about how we see the world through our screens and our, particularly our personal uh, technology, the smartphone technology. Mm -hmm. And more and more, and even more so because of the pandemic, we are living through our screens. But there's this, there's this language that we, that we don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily aware of. We, we, um, we take it for granted, we don't think about it, but there are all these symbols that, that are mediating how we see the world. Yeah, and I want to... these are lovely. They're super resolved to me. The, you're, you're managing to bring all of those things together in such an interesting way. How are you talking about the idea of the diptych? Um, well, I, I, I like series. I like sort of doing things in, in more than one. Sometimes they move slightly. So mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not quite the same. So they're like freeze frames. Mm, okay. Uh, that speaks to the, the technology of video yeah. and film. So that's why I'm using that. and. Um, this one behind me, which isn't part of it, but they're, they're basically heads moving slightly. 
Um, but it's also religious. And I love the idea of, and that's what I'm going to do probably after this for the next year or so, just delve into the idea of um, technology as a religion, as a, as a substitute yeah. for a religion. Yeah. Um, but um, before, before going on to that, if we have time, um, this year down the middle, um, I was trying to think about the, the making and incorporating the technology of making the paintings into the actual paintings mm -hmm. rather than ignoring it. So this sort of, these squares, I've, they used to be gray and white, but they were too strong. So I, I actually put them, they were like this before, um, right, which is Photoshop. Yeah. I wanted to paint in Photoshop. Ah, interesting. But I decided that that was too overpowering. Yeah, but nice use of color, like that really does neutralize them in a way. But yeah, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I also applied a coat of resin because I wanted them to be all screen like. Mm -hmm. So all of the paintings in the MFA series are shiny, shiny, shiny. Um, and in a way it makes them, um, the images more, more highly saturated and sharper. Like when you take a photograph of an image on your iPhone and you send it to somebody, it actually looks nearly sometimes better on your screen than it does in, to your eye. Do you think that would be something you would continue? Like, that's very interesting. I mean, could that be a kind of like a real citation of the work now? I mean, even in the next year or two, are you fascinated by that finish? Completely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it changes yeah. the painting. Yeah, it changes it from being a painting to this object. Yeah, nice. A different type of thing. And mm -hmm. it, as somebody said to me, it sort of obliterates the painting and it does. It just takes it away completely. Yeah. And yeah, it's a yeah. sort of a... You're, you're painting a digital image to look digital. You know, you're, you're basically, it's sort of reflexive in a way. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that about it. It's sort of, in a way, it's it's sort of Mad Max, like, you know, you're painting or using this, this um, technology in a way which is sort of um, deifying it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, it's like, um, what's the word? Um, I can't think of the right word, but you know, in a church, you might find an, a, a symbol of something that you, you venerate, mm -hmm. an object of veneration. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but I mean, the materiality, and, what you're doing with material intellectually and physically is very, very interesting. I think it's um, quite exciting. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a wasp um, and it's, it's very, they're all oil on board, nearly all of them. Um, but when it's, this is pre-resin because when you resin something, it's really difficult to photograph. Okay, um, interesting again, right? <laughs> In relation to our, our, co our Zoom life, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So it's, it's part of a triptych, which was to be, bef which I was going to make into more, make it um, a series of these small squares and have them of different animals further down the, the, um, the, the food chain in a way, because um, I, I'm also interested in the science of um, the order of things and how we have this, we've developed this hierarchy of us at the top, obviously, and everything to be at our disposal. So part of the response to the Anthropocene and part of the sort of a post-human thinking on it is the need to decenter the human and to, to make space, as Donna Haraway says, for getting along with other things. So this sort of chitholic being of, of melding different types of organic and inorganic, even technological existence is something that I was trying to get to, but I haven't yet. So I was going to make a series of small paintings and, and put them together with like a jigsaw. Um, but anyway, at the moment, it's a triptych. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very interesting. And of course, um, I mean, you've, you've had the situation in which you've put those paintings up and people can only view them through the window. Um, yes. But I mean, you chose a space and you kind of, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I'm just curious about what your decision was in relation to the resolution in COVID was just to hang it and hope for the best in a way, right? Yes, yeah, we never, none of us predicted, um, we sort of hoped we'd get an opportunity to yeah. have an ex exhibition, but none of us really thought, well, I didn't think it, it would, I couldn't think of how it was going to actually materialise. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm happy. Is there anything about the sighting of the work that you want to say, or, you know, um, in, in the gallery, even, even if we're all watching this and experiencing it through the screen? Yeah, this, I mean, this is by the window, so I'm very lucky that people can actually see it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
it's easy to see the projections through the screen as well, through the window, which is wonderful. And so, um, but some will work if it's, if it's a bit further back and it's on a wall and people can't see it, it's, it's very hard. Although obviously we have the opportunity to have them online yeah. and visual, you know, visible that way, which is good. Um, but yeah, okay. it's tricky. All right. Um, so I, I, just one more I'll show you. Um, this was Capitalocene. Um, and it has more facial, you can't see them here. This is a picture in the Royal Ulster Academy, but this is, um, he's got a facial recognition square on him and the, well. the okay. guy behind him has a facial recognition square, but you can't really see it. Um, and it's, it's talking to the globalization of, of production and consumption mm -hmm. in a very high saturation, sort of nearly eye-watering brightness of color, yeah. um, which I quite like. Um, yeah. No, really, congratulations. I think these are highly resolved. It's very interesting to see where the practice will go now. I think you've really achieved something okay. quite um, tangible and very consistent. So it's, it's yeah, really Thank well you. done. <laughs> I was trying to make a new, I suppose I, in the beginning, I set myself an impossible task of looking to make a, a, a new language for this sort of mediation, digital mediation. Um, but I think probably one of the most successful experiences that I had over the, uh, particularly last year, was the um, collaboration with Maria in the Goethe Institute. We produced um, a show together, um, her security zones and my telemorphosis. Yeah, nice. And, you can see, exactly. Just, this is a good yeah. dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, my name is Jessica. I graduated from visual communications in NCAD um, where I studied graphic design and I kind of specialize as an illustrator, uh, primarily working in graphic art. Um, but I have been out of college for a few now, years now and I decided to do the ACW course um, to kind of build on my own profession again and to find my style that I liked working in. Um, mm -hmm. I found myself kind of going back to graphic design in this project, um, especially working with the posters and the podcast. And my project focuses on um, the political music and its uh, role in changing society and culture. And how I did it was um, basically I created this podcast that reflects the moments of the civil rights movement where music played a fundamental role in spreading the messages of the movement and trying to inform people on the injustices committed against African-American citizens. So uh, the American civil rights movement. You're talking yeah, the American about. civil okay. rights movement, yeah. Um, so the reason I chose the topic was at the beginning of the year, um, I was attending the Black Lives Matter protests. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, due to uh, circumstances of dis social distancing and COVID, we were unable to have another protest. So I couldn't really participate in a way. And I still felt like I wanted to raise awareness on the issues within American society. Um, so I chose to work in an alternative way through my art. Um, and I found that some of the circumstances of today's society reflected the civil rights movement and the same kind of issues that concerned people at that time. Um, so my topic focuses on music of the civil rights movement, and I have come from a musical background. I've been studying music since I was like five, um, so it's it's a big passion of mine. And I was inspired by the work of artists like Billie Holiday and Nina Simone and Ray Charles. Um, I just found their music profoundly uh, passionate and uh, emotive. Uh, so their work really inspired this project. Um, I'm just going to share the posters that I made. You might have seen them. Yeah. No, but it's lovely to see again and hear you talk about them. So bad with technology. <laughs> okay. Um, It'll just take a sec, I think. Can you see it there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, each... Poster is named after uh, a song, mm -hmm. and I chose 
to do five different events within the posters. And I thought these were really significant events within the civil rights movement where music actually played a prominent role in spreading the messages. So the first song here, we have Mississippi Goddamn by Nina Simone. And it was about the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, so a horrible violence committed against African-American citizens. And the song is really reflective of the frustration and anger felt by that community at the time. Um, and because of Simone's success within society and around the world, she was able to use her platform to kind of communicate all of these mm -hmm. frustrations and inequalities. Um, so yeah, there's a poster there. I'm just gonna fly through. <laughs> sure. Uh, the next one is Fables of Phobos. It's another song title. And it was about the Little Rock Nine, um, which were a group of black students. They were the first to go into um, school during the time. And there was lots of protests from white kind of conservatives against this. Uh, so when artist Charles Mingus wrote about the event um, that transpired, there was a massive protest um, against these students just going to school. Uh, so he wrote about all the inequalities within education and the flaws within government and their neglect to actually address all of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to show a few of them. The Jazz Ambassadors. Um, I kind of took style from Matisse. He did these decoupage um, compositions that I really liked and they're all reflective of jazz. Mm -hmm. Each of the shapes is supposed to reflect kind of improvisation and the um, eccentric kind of character of jazz music. Mm. And so it's really vibrant and expressive. And that's what I wanted to reflect in this poster. Mm. Um, so as you can see, the Jazz Ambassadors were a group of musicians that were used as a form of propaganda to make the US um, basically look like this haven for equality. Um, during tensions with the Soviet Union, they had black artists promote America um, with their music because jazz became so popular around the world. Um, these artists were seen as like poster children for American society. Um, so yeah, they're super beautiful. I have so many questions. Do you want to keep <laughs> going or uh, can I start with my questions? Or oh, you can ask to... as many questions as you like. Okay. Uh, so I'm really interested in the fact that you've kind of you've you've decided to resolve it in relation to your graphic uh, capacities, and that's really exciting because they are just beautiful. Uh, so what did you represent in the podcast? So the podcast was my way of making the dissertation a lot more accessible to people. Um, I so was it interviews? Was it music? Was it? It's primarily reflecting on music from okay. the civil rights movement. So I noticed that I was writing about it a lot, but you can't really get that experience until you hear it. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, it gives you a sense of actually being in that moment mm. and being able to empathize mm. with what people were going through at the time. Mm. Um, so the podcast, reflects like a lot of other singers that I might have left out in the posters. Um, okay. Musicians that were really, really important at that time. And how did that work for you? Was that a new medium for you to work with the podcast? And, and did you kind of get interaction with other people in relation to how you wanted to expose it? I'm just curious because, I mean, I love radio. I love podcasts. I'm just interested in how it worked for you artistically. Um, I've never done one before, but I noticed that during lockdown, everyone was listening to podcasts sure um so that i thought that was an easier platform to go through i know people don't really read as much anymore but podcasts are something that mm. love because it's way more accessible um no I, I did it myself but i had another sound project with a few people during lockdown where we created our own composition um just from random songs that we were working on and we mm -hmm. put it all together so it was chaotic but it was a form of 
communication for us. Yeah, a form of exchange, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you do it again? Do you see it as a big part of the practice going forward to work with the podcast? Because I mean, yeah, I've it's really interesting to see how you've distilled the notion of the graphic. Um, so I'm just curious about the podcast as a medium or as a, a tool. Um, I've done a few more chapters to kind of add to the um, podcast. Mm. But um, I don't know if it would necessarily be the medium that I would prefer to work in. OK, so that's interesting as well. And knowledge, right? Yes. Uh, whether whether it's something that propels the practice or is just a medium or a vehicle for the practice. Um, OK, so then I have uh, two other questions uh, in relation to the notion of political music. Mm. And the sonic, actually, the sonic as a big aesthetic kind of idea. I mean, there's um, many things I'm thinking about there, um, you know, and I think it's really exciting that you've managed to kind of marry all these interests in some way. So how to push that or what what, what you're thinking is about that. I am um, I'm working on a show that's going to come eventually to Emma, even though it was uh, begun already in. I think 2017, but uh, with the Otholith group. So they're filmmakers, but they're also thinking very, I mean, about so many of these things, um, uh, the planetary uh, black avant-garde uh, heritage, um, I don't know, the, uh, and the Anthropocene, so many things in their filmmaking, but they would say a big part of their work is the sonic and yeah. very few people actually um, announce that you know, as part of an aesthetic practice in a way, if, 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 if they're thinking visual arts. And so I'm interested in the idea of how you're thinking what the sonic triggers in you. Um, so, um, and one of the key people that might be interesting for you to look at is somebody like Julius Eastman, mm -hmm. who is in more the eighties. So kind of a queer black composer from the eighties, who is uh, just doing the most extraordinary political work later. But yeah. just if this is something that you wanted to pursue, and then my other question is about how you marry the idea of the political, like if you're talking about going out and walking and being on the marches, so the immediate political and the context of something like the American civil rights movement, like the abstraction of, of the political, the immediate political to a time and a place that is not yours or ours or, or whatever, it's not present. Yeah. So there's, there's, I'm just curious about that. Would you continue to, to pursue this idea of the political um, in relation to the sonic or the protest song? Um, obviously there's some really interesting links between Free Berkeley and the American Civil Rights Movement and Free Dairy, for example. Um, there's a, you know, uh, something like the Stardust and even Christy Moore singing like there's protest songs in relevant to kind of Irish political situation. Is that something that interests you or what? How would you articulate the idea that you cited it somewhere quite far away in time and in geography? Um, well, actually, my starting point was political music in general. In general, right. But like punk music in the 70s. Mm. Um Irish music during the Troubles mm. um, kind of I went like global but I thought during lock time it was a, a time of like reflection and contemplation mm -hmm. because we had the time to start paying attention to all these events around us mm -hmm. we were becoming way more informed about the inequalities within society so that kind of brought me back to the attention that the world um, saw during the civil rights movement, like it was, it was on the media because it was such a momentous occasion mm -hmm. for all the civil rights protesters. Um, I'd definitely be interested in pursuing the topic further, like trying to develop mm -hmm. on the idea. Um, obviously it was like a bit time restricted but I'd love to explore a few different disciplines. And well, yes and no. I mean, you resolved it very beautifully in relation to the graphic sense and, and you know, and, and a particular subject matter that you kind of wanted to represent. So, I mean, I think all of those things are quite interesting and, and, and you know, pretty resolved, I suppose. I'm just curious about what, where you would go in the future. So, so thank no you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Let's get this done first. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. Not at all. Okay, let's go for it then. Okay. Um, okay, so my name is, is Brendan, Brendan Fox. Um, I work as both a visual artist and as an artist, I suppose I would um, have really 
so I suppose my my um, practice would really have manifested through film, I suppose, and film installation. Mm -hmm. um, I work as an independent curator as well, and as a theatre of the oppressed <laughs> practitioner too. Um, and I, my, um, I suppose my curatorial practice is very interested in kind of grassroots projects, um, artist-led projects, and um, how to create projects in, in, um, in within communities. Um, so just with regards to the project and the work that's on show um, currently um, in the exhibition I looked at Mirage, um, Games for Artists and Non-Artists Archive um, is currently on display. Um, Games for Artists and Non-Artists uh, began as a series of curated active collaborations and experiments drawing um, on Auguste Boal's Theatre of the Oppressed and his, um, his arsenal of exercises really in games for actors and non-actors. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it began very much um, <laughs> in a very physical realm um, in a studio at the Irish Museum of Modern Art. Um, and then obviously due to lockdown, and restrictions, which I can't really avoid talking about, unfortunately, because a lot of the work speaks to that. Um, the, the, due to the lockdown, um, I brought the project online and co continued new um, interactions and manifestations uh, with um, uh, uh, around over 50 artists um, over the period of the, the first and second lockdown. So there's... Um, I suppose an array really of themes um, encompassing isolation, mental health, um, artistic paralysis, um, temporality and solidarity. Um, and these uh, interactions also produce an archive of works and of the resilience of the over 50 artists involved in the project to date. Um, so just to give you, I'm going to do the, the share screen. This is the moment everyone dreads, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if um, too many things open there. Um, so I can just do Sorry. This is my fault. Sorry, I know I should. Don't worry, take your time. Be wasting time. So. Um, well, I think I've blown the time thing, so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is. Um, I don't know if you can. Can you see me? Yeah, well? that's good. It's come up yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You kind of get an idea of what's happening here. So this is the the installation um, as it's as it stands, and I thought it was. Um, important from kind of a curatorial perspective as well that there was a lot of um, kind of filmic work that was made um, by the artists involved in the project um, and there was a lot of kind of gestural and gentle pieces of work made at that time mm. quiet pieces of work um, and then there were also a lot of other um, elements and pieces of work I suppose that um, spoke to kind of <laughs> frustration So sorry, I'm just going to let some of that play without. Um, so I, I just I'm going to keep that playing on the side because it just gives you kind of an idea. Um, mm -hmm. Also, one of the thing that, things that was really important as well was this idea of using Instagram as a curatorial platform for the work. Mm -hmm. so built up a community of artists, I suppose, within that space um, post lockdown uh, or during lockdown, I should say. And then the artists were also kind of interacting with each other's work mm. um, so in isolation and obviously um, in, in the background of all this there's a series um, uh, of uh, I suppose kind of ongoing emails and this kind of you know kind of the backstage of technology versus the versus the Instagram as well and uh, I worked with with, with uh, a lot of uh, collectives and um, um, independent visual artists as well um, I think that gives you a flavour of what the, the, what the project is, um, so it might be more uh, helpful to kind of to have, to have a chat regards to it now, maybe. 
Great. Thanks so much. So would you do it again? Would you work with Instagram in relation to this? Because, I mean, I can imagine it's a massive challenge if you're thinking about the theatre of the oppressed and you're thinking about the kind of notion of social conviviality as a medium. Um, yeah, COVID must be difficult. Yeah, I think that that's, that's actually, that's kind of, one of the things I found with, with regards to using it as a platform was you don't get the, the you know, the cathedral of the, of the space, you know, the mm. museum. There's something about the intimacy of people making work and sending it to you and it being part of this shared platform and your, this construction of a narrative within that, I suppose, became something that was, was, that, was that was interesting, that it was a collective narrative that spoke mm. to the zeitgeist or the current situation. Uh, in one particular element of that was the, um, I suppose, the, the, the tag kind of idea of um, asking artists to make a piece of work about their hands. Because obviously, originally, the, the, the workshops that would have taken place would have been very physical and would have been, um, I suppose, really, really rooted in, in a kind of a keen interaction in both each other's uh, practices, the, the participating artists' practices, you know, the, the um, and working kind of collectively as well. So trying to create something like that, that meant the artists felt they were invested in it and felt they had a foothold, meant working with artists over, over periods of time. So working with child naming ceremony um, and working with Gum Collective, and then working with some of some of the group here, and uh, you know, and allowing us to to experiment, but in a very different format than the original, perhaps mm. would have, would have, or, you know. So these manifestations, I suppose, speak to speak to the now, maybe rather than what um, what 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 originally. Well, completely. And I think to fetishize in a way a Boal in relation to notions of presentism or theatre in whatever way is kind of pointless right now, because I mean, the impetus is deeply political, right? So whatever means to galvanize kind of a political community is the issue. So that's yeah. really interesting that you found, found a way through. My second question there in relation to Boal is just thinking about the idea that normally it's a means towards legislation. So I'm just curious as to is that part of the intention of the work or yeah how you think the notion of the political literally in its kind of literal sense of of legislation yeah i think what's 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 was fascinating i suppose for me was having kind of a background in teo and looking at pulling um I suppose it's it's so kind of rooted in kind of um, the actor's practice and, and in theatrical practice um, for for that creative training, but obviously massively rooted in in the political um, and in the idea of, I suppose, um, I know if you're looking at you know rainbow of desire to games for artists and non-artists to looking at his legislative theater work i was trying to find i suppose a way in for the experiments to take place so image theater was um what seemed like the probably the easiest way for us to start and make a creative connection um, um with visual artists um as a way in to the work um, and obviously that had that working with image theater which is essentially Boal talking about the idea that an image itself is a is a is a is a language is is a and you know I suppose from a theat theatrical perspective that creating that image with your body does have a political power and creating an image with um, a collective of individuals for political ends has a political power and it's very much about the the active those you know breaking that breaking the north wall and making sure that the, the viewer is active um within kind of the proceedings so i always find that kind of very interesting and that 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 notion of being in between which i felt we all were very much feeling and this idea of metaxis where you can both look at the notion of being the subject of an image or and the the image of a subject and you can be both of these things kind of at the same time. And we were all in a very liminal space at the time. Um, and I think from a political from a political perspective that the project I think has evolved now to an extent where these kind of aspects are starting to kind of flourish that little bit more um, as 
I, I kind of myself as well, and other people involved are finding um, that through the experimentation that there's kind of a, a foundation for that. Okay. Yeah. That's really interesting, right? So then there's the, there's the analytical moment in your own practice as to whether the, the examination of the phenomenon aesthetically is the thing that's driving you or whether actually the mobilization politically is driving you or both. <laughs> because I'm just watching Instagram today and everybody with the eye on the hand again, you know, Absolutely. right? In relation to the mother and baby. And so, I mean, there's literal, very clear manifestations of kind of political movement and moment happening all the time we know this right um so i'm just curious about your reading of those ideas of politics in relation to this i think that to resolve that would be interesting whether the the backdrop is rhetorical or actually part of the tool is kind of a fundamental um i think uh, sense of direction for you and i and i think both both questions would be completely valid you know yeah. or both answers you know whether whether it's a driving force or whether it's a um, an aesthetic uh, analysis of the phenomenon or a, um, a curatorial imperative towards creativity um, yeah. is also a perfect answer. Yeah, I think I think it's actually I think it's actually both of the, both of those things. I think that um, you have to kind of go through a series of processes if you if you're if you're looking at kind of Boal's arsenal of exercises or, or how he kind of approaches things. And I think for the project to kind of go, we're looking at kind of really kind of uh, um, the hybridity of that, I suppose, as well, mm -hmm. through contemporary arts practice. Um, the project now has kind of moved into, because there, there are other kind of satellite projects happening within this. And um, the Museum of Everyone is a project that is now happening with games for artists and non-artists, which sees us working in, um, first of all, uh, uh, just one direct provision centre um, and commissioning artists who work, um, who are making more kind of politically engaged art and who are interested in that kind of facet of, of, uh, of study, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, to, to an extent. So it certainly is, you know, there are, we're at a stage, I suppose, where these kind of manifestations are, are coming to the coming to the fore of the project. And that that, that is exciting. But I would I would also say that there, I suppose there is there is a, an aesthetic there. Um, and I think that that's something that in itself needs to that you know that that in itself is is can be political. Uh, sure, like sure, absolutely. I think I think though there is a critical moment at some point if if the general project develops with these kind of tools where you have to kind of make a, a decision. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, around the notion of, um, and I'm thinking of Tanya Bruguera, art util, when it actually is useful and when the implication of the stakes for those involved are deeply political. Mm -hmm. And if that's your interest, you know, uh, just in, in relation to that kind of political responsibility idea as distinct from the language of politics. Yeah. So it's like, how far are you going to push it? Is yeah. an interesting question just in relation to how you might uh, go, go forward. Yeah, and I absolutely, I, I think I think you're absolutely right as well. Um, and Tanya Bergera and all, obviously Alistair Hudson, who's also involved in the Art of Util. Um, the, I mean, that, that creative framework was actually, the Art Util's uh, framework was something that was really uh, kind of important for me. It actually gave me a really nice um, framing mechanism for how, how, how I was going to move forward with this project. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that um, to be for, for, you know, I think I from I have to be very kind of conscious of my of how I am or who I am as well. Sure. Yeah. For, for, for regards to this. And I think that that's something as you know, as a as a as a I'm, I'm queer, but I'm white. And I, you know, so I always I, I suppose for me, the other thing with working it within Ed Boal's um, the realm of um, of Boal's practice um, gives me kind of more opportunities to stay aware of that, that to be sensitive to those situations and maybe just to develop a, a platform for others to engage in necessarily rather than my, my uh, consistent ne ne need to steer. And or, and or, it's also what generates and, and motivates you as an artist, you know, and what, what your voice is. It's about, it's about you know, um, uh, thinking about all those things in relation to what gives you energy. Yeah. Uh, because ultimately you don't want to be a servant of a kind of um, an empty uh, structure, you know? I mean, ultimately it has to be about what drives you. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was really interesting.
Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, all right. I've got two presentations, one on background, one on present. So I'll just start them because they do all the introduction stuff for me. Hello. Broad life making public oriented creative projects for a period of 17 years. For this presentation, I will focus on two examples. The first, an art exhibit. The second, a creative experiment, an example of what I call stone soup. My first solo show in 2008 was Zulu at Monster Gallery and Studios. This was built off a body of work I had made around youth culture of my younger working class brothers and their friends in rural Ireland. The show was called Zulu after the film starring Michael Caine because it was not about depicting one culture to the other as much it was about creating a genuine space of intersection. The show made use of the structure of the then Monster Truck Gallery, using the back and front rooms along with the street area to operate as a kind of Venn diagram. The back area was converted into a kind of hyper version of a young rural working class male's bedroom. The middle space featured photographs I'd taken of them on various nights out. And lastly, outside for the duration of the show, I had my brother in his car, which he would get into and be taken on a spin around the block whilst listening to interviews I conducted with him and his friends on various nights out over the sound system. As an unannounced surprise on the opening night, I staged an invasion of the space by the same people depicted and sold safari tickets to the patrons who go out with them on a bus that would take them for a night out in that boy before returning them to Dublin the same evening, thus affording the viewer a chance to step through and into the world the exhibition was depicting to them. The second example I wish to point to is my work with Dublin Filmmakers 24 Hour Projects in 2013. This was a group based on meetup.com with 800 members who were making two short films a year. I proposed and then ran a series of 24-hour projects with them. This not only radically increased the output of the group, but allowed the kind of social relations and bonds to form that are the necessary glue for larger projects to stem from. By the end of the summer, there were larger projects in production, including television shows and feature films. The principles that made this such a success are simple and universally applicable but especially so in the creative field and constitute an example of what I call stone soup. The term stone soup comes from a folktale where a stranger carrying a large pot during a time of famine visits a village and by creating the spectacle of making a pot of stone soup in the village square for the entire community, causes a crowd to gather and essentially tricks the community into contributing some of the food they have hoarded for the sake of a communal meal. In the same sense, I take the spirit of this tale in the sense of setting down a core marker around which people can react to in an adaptive, creative manner, and in the process, create an active, creative community everyone can benefit from. 24-hour film projects are an example of something that can achieve this, but not the only methodology. For example, with a minimal organizing framework, such as access to a suitable venue, a simple opening and closing ritual, meals and drinks, simply getting a group of creative in the same space, working on various self-directed or self-devised micro-projects or art games can achieve similar results. And well, yeah, that's a background. So if you want to ask questions about that and then I'll play the, was that legible? Yeah, you could hear that? Yeah, yeah. Make sense? yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, I speak in it because there was like a tree on it for the art. It was for, made for the Arts Council bursary, so I wanted to keep the presentation to three minutes, so it's a bit faster than it would naturally deliver something like that. No, but that's good, and and so that's speaking a little bit to the idea of curatorial work specifically, as distinct from the exhibitionary project. Um, that, that's kind of, I suppose bit of background really you know yeah great um, yeah so an idea i might i'm thinking about considering i've kind of i've you know i've i've taken part in things like startup accelerator for example and i've been yeah. struck by that as a kind of model that's quite effective in terms of that you kind of you have lots of people who are advising you constantly so you get a talk in the morning on say some aspect of marketing then you work on that then you get feedback straight away and there's a constant kind of feedback doing feedback doing and over an intense process you take something that's an idea you expand it find out what the what the problem is who the audience is and you put mm -hmm. that into a package that then you go out and you look for investment for yeah no i love it i mean i think it's really i mean i'm that, that the monster truck exhibition looks extraordinary also i mean i'm so curious um literally about how, how long did that last that project with your with uh, your brother 
oof, that kind of went on for a few years. I did. Okay. It started because we have a garage and um, it was a space that kind of the teenage friends of my brothers would kind of hang out in. Mm-hmm. So I sometimes have my friend there and we'd be sitting on a bench smoking joint. Mm. And I just watch these kids. And I remember turning to my friend and saying, you know, if I was in a theater and this spectacle came out on stage, wouldn't that be kind of amazing? You know, yeah. just kind of watching this, having access is a kind of private world, you know, and it's a very special time for people because you've, you've just turned 18. You just kind of started drinking. You're kind of in that zone mm-hmm. and it's kind of a freedom and intermingling there that's kind of beautiful. In a way, it's know? wild and wildly intense, actually. Mm. Um, um, so to kind of think about how to represent it, it's really kind of fascinating. So I'm just yeah. like curious. I mean, one, I mean like, one I, thing was important to me was I didn't want it to be like putting them in a jar. Like yeah, it was phenomenological or something. Actually coming into the space, so you're not just getting my opinion or interpretation of it, but you're actually confronted with it, and they're there too and partaking. No, it's not just the art world watching them they're also watching the artworks too absolutely no that's gr- i mean that's really really interesting and very just a really sophisticated um set of mediations that you've you've set up which is kind of really interesting i mean even in relation to what we were just talking about earlier and in, in, um in terms of understanding kind of the politics of of how we're gathering or representing or or engaging so i'm i suppose what's interesting for me about that is what um well there's many things i wish i'd seen it and i love the idea of the car trips and all of the immediacy of that and just their own participation so what would you would you sorry loads of people got in the car on the night of the exhibition the opening was successful but then when the show was open no one would get into the car. Oh, really? Yeah, there's Funny. some tourists who come in and I tried to talk it into, but I was like, I'm not getting in a car with fucking <laughs> <laughs> He could try to up the Wicklow Mountains. And so so your brother was um your brother was available for all of those the driving during Yeah, the- it was I started the work with my second youngest brother and his friend. Right. And by the time 20, 2028, uh, 2008, that's um they were too old for that. They kind of already moved into jobs. Yeah, yeah. My youngest brother was then the one at that kind of liminal age, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Childhood and adulthood. But even that idea, right, of the opening and the conviviality of an opening and the idea of like that's a space in which people might do things and then there's a certain idea of of what art time might mean to people or who comes uh, during an exhibitionary period. I mean, even the parsing through all of that is kind of really fascinating. I mean, it's it's kind of awesome that you you managed to just fire on all cylinders, you know, in terms of all of those things. Um, and, and of course, I'm curious about how, what they how they engaged your brothers in terms of it. Did they think it was kind a... of tentative and embarrassed? Like I had this picture. There was awkwardness with the bus. So I had the bus coming up, but mm-hmm. the bus driver wasn't familiar with Dublin. So it took her ages to get there. And I kind of turned off the lights at about half seven or so when they finally got there and they didn't kind of run into like they didn't run into the space they kind of just nervously walked in there because you know they're like 18 year old 17 year old kids you know they're not mm-hmm. gonna, it's gonna you'd have to rehearse with them and things like that you know if I was doing yeah yeah, yeah no I mean I think I think yeah your your idea of the startup and this what sounds very interesting is that you seem to have a good sense of what logistics and strategy are in relation to both manifesting a project and uh, curating, you know. Uh, I spent a lot of time, I've spent about five or six years working on a startup business, didn't go anywhere, but I did take part in a lot of things in that system and kind of got an understanding of marketing, yada, yada, things like that. Yeah, but I mean, what what interesting tools, like if you if you choose to utilize them like this, what what interesting and relevant tools, right? Yeah. yeah. OK, um, so I'm happy for you to present or to talk specifically on the project in, in NTAD, if that's good. Yeah, cool. I'll just, that is queued up to the right point. Um, okay. I have a short, there's a short two minute thing before this, but I won't bother getting into it. This presentation covers the background research of my recent MFA and the resulting final project, the film A Million Years Painting Watercolors, an educational art film, part one. 
The core of the research that led up to the production of this film centers around, though not exclusively, the writings of architect and architectural theorist Christopher Alexander, in particular his four-book essay, The Nature of Order, published from the years 2002 to 2004. This essay is a culmination of some 40 years of practical and theoretical work that has been compared to the writings of Kant in terms of its importance and the fact that some believe this essay is a work that will remain influential for centuries to come. The arguments put forward in The Nature of Order stem from the notion of life as a phenomenon of space and arrangements of matter rather than biological. This biological approach being heavily influenced by the notions of mechanistic theories of nature that are at the core of the scientific method derived from the theories of Descartes. Alexander instead argues that life is a quality of the arrangement of matter, with such an epistemological turn having implications for not just our understanding of architecture, but for understanding of art and indeed reality itself. A key cornerstone of Alexander's ideas is his theory of holes and centers. That is, any hole is a collection of centers, and the degree of life in any given hole is a measure of how well these centers are talking to each other. This being, for Alexander, an objective and measurable phenomenon. For example, consider two identical rooms filled with people. The only difference being in room A, all the people are talking to each other, and in room B, they are turned away from each other in silence. Which room would a stranger off the street describe as being more alive or more dead? Broadly, with a million years painting watercolors, I wanted to make a work that both spoke to these concepts as well as speaking through them, where each part of the film would in essence be in conversation with every other part of the film. For Alexander, he identifies the geometric vectors of communication through what he calls the 15 fundamental patterns. For this film, I instead turn to the tarot namely a pictorial symbology of the universe, which I use both as a conscious and subconscious tool, using each card in the reading as a prompt through which to elucidate various aspects of my research. Though the film uses fairly rudimentary editing techniques, the overall impact of it as a whole is, I would argue, an uncanny quality that can only be experienced through watching the film as intended. The reading I based the film off featured 26 cards. The film as it currently stands deals with 11 of those cards in sequence each card in the reading getting a dedicated segment ranging from one minute to half an hour in length, leaving 15 segments from the 26 card reading still to be filmed and produced. Whilst the techniques I've used to make the film come about for the most part by making together audio and visuals from a variety of sources, including TV and cinema, for the 15 remaining unfilmed segments of the work, my aim is to shoot and edit my own footage. Well, so that's all. You you have a gloriously logistical mind. It's very exciting, I have to say. <laughs> really, really interesting. And also, just um, so so, talk us through your selection of this architect, who of course is a is, sounds like a hardcore modernist. Um, how would I say he wouldn't know? He'd be kind of like an anti-modernist in a way. I guess. Really? His, I mean, rationality, yeah, systematics. One of, uh, well. His background is in mathematics and mm -hmm. physics and that, but he had, did his, he got the first PhD Harvard ever gave in architecture. Right. And, um, and how, yeah, um, how would I say, guys, that's slightly charming. Well, so, I suppose, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm being um, very provocative, I suppose, but to me that that idea of the, the, the complete rationalization of nature and everything we talked about from deep time to kind of um, a, a human kind of interaction uh, to be explained in such rational forms is, I have not read the work, admittedly, uh, is, uh, is fascinating, is, is to me deeply modernist. It kind of, well... But I mean, in a very perhaps super kind of calls way. kind of calls his book the traditional way of building. So one of the things he the inciting incident for him in terms of putting him on this journey was as a young architect in I think the early seventies. Him and his team they're looking at medieval villages and they're wondering why does this have why do these towns have this certain quality that cities mm -hmm. don't have? And so he sat down and with his team they systemized this out and they start with and they wrote a book called The Pattern Language, which is apparently the biggest selling architect book uh, in, of all time. And it starts with kind of big patterns, as in you don't want a town bigger than five thousand people. Like that's the upper limit of that. And it mm -hmm. kind of goes down to the level of decorations. Like um, one 
example, one of his patterns is um, light on both sides of the room. So if there's light coming in from both sides of the room, then that means that people in the room can see each other better and there's more communication there. And that speaks to his concept of centers and holes and the idea of life being a quality of centers being able to talk to each other. Right. Uh, and I suppose just in relation to our discussion around queering things uh, earlier, I mean, I would think about this as certainly not a queering, but rather a very um, uh, norm normative reading of things. Well, you see, it's kind of complicated to explain a bit, but the book starts off, it's four volumes. The first volume kind of hits on the geometry. So right. it has these 15 fundamental patterns. These are things like strong center, void, um, boundaries, interlocking patterns, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then the second book is about process. The third book then is kind of, so process would be um, adaptive change. So rather than you design something in an office 500 miles away and that the architect never visits, the design process is a constantly evolving thing. So for example, if he's given a, if he's say starting to build a house, he gets a blank field. What he does is he will look through that field and he will find the most beautiful area of that field. And that becomes the garden. And that dictates then the house because he will orientate the house so that the windows are facing the garden and therefore the outside and the inside are already in dialogue. And then each state, because he already had the idea of, well, how many beds do you want, yada, yada, yada. Mm. That kind, it's an adaptive process throughout. So it's not the design and then things built, but rather each stage. Okay. Potential for design in it, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. No, nice. I mean, and that's very, yeah, that's quite organic on one level. It still, it still assumes that he understands the, the ultimate beautiful space, right? An empiric, he does make empirical claims over beauty, which I suppose are somewhat. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's very determinist on a certain level. But anyway, tell me about your. But the fourth book, just to say the fourth book then kind of goes into almost borderline deism in that. So, okay. like that quote there. So, one of the conclusions of his epistemology is that art is therefore something that's crucially important. Mm -hmm. that the arrange that if space and life are kind if life isn't this biological thing, but it's actually embedded within matter and within art itself, then suddenly art becomes important. And that's that's not important in the sense that we might think of it when we kind of compare, say, the budget for art to the budget for health. You know, it's not sure. art centers versus hospitals. It's more a kind of cosmic importance, so to speak, mm -hmm. rather than self-importance. And he'd also speak to the importance of, I suppose. How would you say mastery, but mastery in a sense of some kind of higher thing being attached to what you're doing? It doesn't necessarily have to be a belief in a God, but it could be a belief or fidelity to the craft itself, so to speak. Yeah. OK, so what what's interesting for me to understand then is your your um, your invocation of this thinking and your relationship to it. Um, well, I would have kind of come across it um, through watching a talk by a guy called Jesse Shell, uh, who did these really interesting talks on gamification and things like the Penguin Games and how they work. Mm -hmm. Because so I don't have to get into that, but just as an offhand thing, he just kind of mentioned, oh yeah, Chris Alexander, he's the greatest genius of the 20th century. I'd never heard of him and I looked him up. And uh, yeah, he was quite impressive. Um, he's, act he's also very influential in technology he would have been involved in computer science. So wikis and Wikipedias were based on his idea and his ideas of structures and space and that format. I mean, you can have, there's a lot of criticism of Wikipedia, but sure. in a sense, it works, you know? Someone no, built for sure. Wikipedia yeah. and it almost organically built itself. So even that is kind of a proof of his concepts working in a certain way. Yeah, so talk to me about your kind of, your, um, what mobilizes you in relation to something like that? Is it about, again, if we would, if I, and maybe I'm making ridiculous leaps here, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm just interested in the idea that you're kind of apply, like, is, is your interest in the application of a certain group of systematics um, or an exploration of those to see where it will bring you? Including, I suppose, yeah, I mean, yeah, going through a course like this, it was kind of an opportunity to, you know, I kind of knew there's always been questions kind of bugging me in the back of my head, like mm. 
I remember um, I remember William Scott exhibition I went to in Irma when I was like 17 and about to go into NCAD. And I was a cheeky bollocks because I questioned the tour guide lady and I, you know, you know, his drawings look like a ladder. And I kind Always of had this good. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> it, that's, uh, I'm gonna go to art college and they're gonna brainwash me into thinking that ladders yeah. are winning, you know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I kind of questioned the, uh, yeah. the person and asked, mm-hmm. okay, well, what's the difference between that and a child's drawing? Why is a child's mm-hmm. drawing on a fridge and that an Emma? And the tour guide lady was kind of stumped and I kind of said to myself, okay, well, if I'm going to go to fucking art college, then I'm going to make sure I'm someone who kind of actually knows what that is. So those have always been questions that have been in the back of my mind. And I suppose a lot of the reading and research I did for this wasn't just Christopher Alexander. It was um, other writers kind of who spoke to different things like Mihaly Shizik Mihaly, probably murdering his name, who does the flow books. And there was Willem Flusser who Dominique has also uh, written about, and uh, uh, Nicholas Luhmann as well, and uh, Ursula Gwynn, and mm. John Murray Arthur too. Mm. And they kind of, they would have kind of filled in gaps, I suppose, some of them look at technology. Mm. Uh, Chizik Mahali, he kind of looks at creativity itself. Mm-hmm. So one of the interesting things he says is that, he was once asked, so what is one of the defining, he said, the most consistent thing in a great artwork is the fact that the artists, when they're making it, they don't know how it's going to turn out. Mm. Like it's like it's almost an unconscious process. And mm. I kind of did this film in that way. Like the tarot was a way for me to kind of plug into an unconscious project because, you know, I knew I'd done the work. I know I've kind of got enough. And that was just kind of a framework. And I was able to use the different means and really, of the yeah. to kind of tease out well that reminds you of that scene that scene that scene that scene mm-hmm. i downloaded a shitload of films and then you know that was mm-hmm. my library and i'd go through the films and kind of pick them out and pull out the different bits and stick them in yeah i i find it absolutely glorious i don't know there's something about the way your brain works and the kind of logistical systematics that creates the infrastructure in which you explore something that i find just deeply intriguing and i really appreciate that you're so transparent about it like in in relation to how you've explained all of these projects so so my my question in the end is uh were you satisfied with the results because i think it uh, like i said i find it really really interesting and quite exciting so um if you set yourself that task to figure that out or to see where that would have brought you uh what do you think of the of the, oh, of the resolution it worked. like how this film came together um, it came together very quickly. It doesn't mm-hmm. look like something that was put together in two weeks, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and very often I find that when I put a clip in, it would sync up in weird ways later on. Yeah. So like I put a bit of music in and I play it and then I suddenly see these movements are in sync with a little beat going on in the background or there'd be a line of dialogue that would sync in perfectly with something that I hadn't even considered. Like, mm-hmm. and he's working in his office or design something like that. And it shows a man working in an office at the same point. So there was quite an uncanny thing mm. going on throughout the process. And I kind of, I want to do something that both spoke literally of the ideas, but also spoke through them. I like, tried to really apply and test them. Okay, if this is legitimate, then I gave myself a narrow time window. So it kind of forced me to have to do it, you know? Sure. Um, and yeah, it worked. I was happy with it. We did the screening yesterday and it went pretty well, although it was a mild tech nightmare at the start. But that was fine. No one cares now. <laughs> it's all done. Yep. Yeah, I, I think what would be interesting is given given the amount of sort of front loading you do in relation to thinking, uh, systematizing, um, I'd be curious just in your own practice about how you care or not for others' reactions to it um whether that's productive or not well it's like you know when you've done something that works you know you yeah know yeah yeah yeah, it yeah, just yeah. Kind of, it pops you know yeah. when you're mentality yeah. and you're not having to force it you're just yeah. doing it you know you're in what chizik mahali calls flow so to speak yeah exactly okay awesome thank you i really enjoyed that so i guess just to introduce myself um I'm an architect uh, foremost, I guess, um, that undertook ACW kind of in pursuit of more expanded practice. And that pursuit is is informed by an interest in how and what constructs narratives around us. 
-hmm. and I guess a kind of wariness towards um, what's embedded in them and how a subject is produced via those um, embedded intentions, we'll say, in power structures. Um, so like I use the word narrative in a very broad sense because it's something that it kind of allows me to connect all these tangents, whether it's architecture or writing or curation and kind of consider them as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this kind of obsession comes from the fact that we are in a world where we are drowning in information and that power operates in such an immaterial way. So I, I think there's a kind of retaliation in how we can appropriate or deconstruct narratives as a way to kind of offering like different readings or allowing different readings to emerge, we'll say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think personally, like I'm what I'm where I'm always trying to go or what I'm always trying to do is to find a way to work away from the subject and kind of like back to the body and like that the only way you can kind of avoid the specific specificities of language is like by introducing these kind of instabilities that that allow something to become more about experience than than about knowledge more knowledge production we'll say um so kind of along those lines um the piece I have in the exhibition is a response to Wolfgang Tillman's uh, Rebuilding the Future exhibition at IMA. And I guess there were really particular attributes of that exhibition that resonated with me along those lines and kind of allowed me to kind of pursue, to pursue expanding and exploring those thoughts. So that was kind of why I included it. Fantastic. I mean, super interesting. Again, so many questions. <laughs> um, <Okay. Go> for <laughs> first, awesome, like as an architect uh, that you're pursuing this. Um, not that I, I mean, I wouldn't have any particular summation or conclusions about architects, but I just find the whole practice so fascinating. And, and then this idea somehow about access to power. I mean, surely the built world is ultimately the manifestation of a certain kind of Exactly. Of power. Like, so the idea that you're trying to deviate around that or explore yeah. that is just super fascinating. Or I, I think it's my awareness of those things. Yeah. That, like, yeah. You know, that I that I know like exactly how that works. Walking, walking past any wall around you, any boundary, any line, yeah. like has already been this like complex negotiation of policy, of regulation, of conversation, of you know, and I can read that in, mm -hmm. in the environment itself because I'm here as an architect you know so yeah, it just yeah. really highlights to me like how much is going on and how how do you how do you work away from it how do you avoid it how do you beat it or like how do you show something else we'll say least, when when those forces are are kind of everywhere yeah or at least trouble it so I mean what yeah what yeah yeah, or, great yeah endeavor yeah what a great endeavor really um, so you made this as a, I mean, I read the text. Uh, it was also an audio piece. Was that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the exhibition, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really, I mean, I've, I, of course, it was before my time. It was uh, the great Sarah Glenny, who's now with you guys, who uh, initiated that show of Volkan Tillmans. And again, I think what a sophisticated artist on some levels in terms of how he does deal with space and how he deals with um regimes of representation whether it's a postcard or you know literally how yeah. he's seeing and your reading of it is uh, really beautiful and and really quite sensitive in a way that I really enjoyed because you do yeah you're bringing another kind of discipline to the reading of it which is quite exciting I think um so certainly that's that's one thing I could say um so I'm yeah so I guess I'm very curious about um the sense of where that would go uh I am too <laughs> I guess <laughs> um it's it's definitely it's something in pursuit like it's mm. I feel well maybe you know, I'm, maybe it's a too big a question I suppose one thing is would it be writing if you're talking about embodiment or you're talking about kind of in the being in the interest interests of these kind of very complex and dominant forms of power and manifestations where 
yeah, what what triggers you? What would be your aesthetic and artistic resolutions? Would they always be writing or sound or uh, um, really trying to think about something that isn't necessarily built or maybe I'm wrong? I don't know. Well, I, I guess it's it's always tends to start in writing because writing is the kind of, I think, easiest way for me to um test test something we'll say you know because it's not I don't have to build it I, mm-hmm. I it costs me no money you know and I can I can interrogate it that way um so I think the ideas always start in a kind of written way but mm-hmm. yeah ideally that's then these could continue and become physical manifestations and start to work their way into this curatorial approach and um try to start to embody these ideas in a physical sense and public public sense Mm -hmm. um yeah um i suppose there's so many questions in relation to the idea of the heritage of things like conceptual art and language-based work i mean or somebody like tony Cox or others who are using language in these very interesting ways right now in terms of manifesting kind of artistic practice uh, just curious about that like what yeah where this could go um i i don't i don't really know i guess yeah okay where where is it reactive where? right so that's also interesting is your interest like you you read you did something very creative but you also reacted or read the the Tillman's show yeah I mean and I mean that in the most respectful and productive sense reactive I'm just curious yeah I mean I guess I have this fascination with space and how we experience it and what we are experiencing when we're in it whether we realize or not Mm -hmm. and I think so I kind of like think of the curatorial as maybe architecture's antithesis because architecture is about being a mediator you know it has it has to mediate you know it has Mm -hmm. to function it has to mediate it has to uh be usable but like so there's always going to be a restriction with what you can do with space in that way but when you move into something like the curatorial it is also i think like a spatial practice but it's where where questions can be raised and where like you can you know interrogate or negotiate or engage people in a way in 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 these other spatial ways that like i could never do i think as an architect and i find something about that so interesting and I think that's always how I'm kind of reading exhibitions when I go into them and not just for content but for the experience from the beginning to the end because you know there's a residue with you as you go through like nothing is in really in isolation and like so it's that that moment of experience and those moments of thoughts are 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 what I think like in a physical they're in a physical engagement, we'll say. So like yeah. that's kind of and and especially with the rebuilding the future work, like his work is it's all about those kind of moments of human existence. So there there was such disparity and and I felt like how they were being presented was also working towards conveying that to like not to not be able to synergize synergize themes or not be able to be too literal towards the work because that's specifically not what he's about Mm. and how they were able to do that through this the kind of um the differences in scales the methods of hanging the ways you were kind of pushed and pulled through the exhibition or what was in your eye line on one side and facing you directly through another through its threshold like I felt that was all ways to kind of reinforce the kind of things and the themes in his work we'll say so I, just... I, I think I think as the site of research and a site of reading what you're suggesting is so missing from the scene and so great and um, this is like a, the problem because I had like obsession is a word I would use you know and I but I and I'm always kind of like trying to get there or trying to figure it out but it's um 
Well, well you I can't mean, find someone that's already said the same thing or you can't, you know, draw from, you can only draw bits and pieces from others to try and like keep stitching your argument together. Like yeah. it's, it's so therefore, interesting, but yeah. Yeah, no, totally. But I mean, I suppose therefore, and this maybe sound ridiculously nitpicky and probably I'm not even sure if it's an, an interesting um, analysis I'm making actually, <laughs> but I'm not sure it's curatorial. I think it's actually your reading and your artistic. You're, 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 you know, because I think curating is actually mediating too. It is staging encounters. It is uh, uh, somewhere. I mean, there's an intellectual uh, capacity to it for sure. But I think, I think there is, um, it's, it, it is, it is a mediation role. It's a staging of encounters. Um, it can be, it can be developing a kind of curatorial thesis or an intellectual thesis. Um, so, like I said, maybe I'm just nitpicking, but I, I kind of think what you're doing is actually much more about a kind of um, a really fascinating moment of reading, which is a critical analysis, which is an intellectual prospect that I'm really excited by, because I think that level of analysis, uh, especially based on your um, on your architectural knowledge and your political concerns could could bring us to somewhere quite new. And and your need to write it in the way that you wrote it is quite um, artistic. So, yeah. I, like I said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> More question marks. No, no, no. <laughs> it's I haven't thrown you into some kind of um, But uh, you know what I mean? I mean, I think, I mean, the curating is as much a, a set of um, pragmatic decisions around organizations, logistics, money, encounter, as well as, in, you know, I mean, I often think it's very akin to somewhere between being a director and a producer in theater. There's all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And one, one can romanticize curating at a level that sometimes it doesn't actually benefit from. Um, I think it's super important. I'm happy to be one, <laughs> but it's quite a pragmatic um, um, occupation on some levels. I hope it's a really intellectually challenging one too. Um, but but I'm wondering whether what you're doing is actually much more specific, and whether and and I suppose my question in questioning whether I'm offering you useful information is that if you would understand what your skill is how you would build on it because I think it's really extraordinary. I think your your ability to read this work means that you could be the most extraordinary critic and you're you're in the best sense of the word, like defining literally the parameters of what this knowledge production is. And yet it's also a very creative enterprise because you're reading it sensitively, artistically within space. Um, there's something quite dramatically productive and new about what you're writing that isn't really to me about curating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk later. I can talk that... My bio now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but maybe, maybe I misunderstand, or maybe no, 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 no. Your I repertoire, mean, but I don't know. You know, like I, yeah, yeah. which I'm is very a great, much great place to be in. Yeah, it's yeah, more yeah, about yeah. Where so it goes. Is, yeah. Like the most valuable thing for me is for people with experience to give me those kind of feedbacks because I'm searching a lot of the yeah. time and trying yeah. to figure it out. So yeah, no, it's like um, kind of really interesting to hear your perspective on it because yeah, like when something is so new, people, I don't know, like even um, talking with Anne with regards to this exhibition, you know, like what might not have been obvious information to her, like, when she said it to me, you know, like it, I, I could have maybe labored for weeks and never come to those conclusions, you know, so it's like quite a new world for me to be yeah. engaging with. So yeah. like, yeah, those kind of comments go really far for me because yeah, I'm just still getting a grip, I guess, on, on, on how to understand what I'm doing and what, what it can be. Yeah. But maybe what you're doing is just not quite being defined yet. So it's not, you know, so that's it. Yeah. So just keep going. Okay, great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Paul, last but not least. Hello. Hi. We The last time we met was at, at Morris O'Connell's memorial. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so very nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And um, yeah, and, and Morris kind of informs some of what I, I'm, I'm doing. And um, so basically, uh, 
like I suppose I consider myself primarily at the moment a visual artist, you know, mainly painting. I've done print work. I also am a musician and a poet, but you know, they're very much something you do sitting around the house when you're sitting around the house all the time. I think I approached the the MA. It was really for me, I was searching for, you know, a kind of a distillation of like an artistic identity. You know, I was I was trying to understand what what I was trying to say. So in some ways it was almost an exploration of an inner world. Mm. You know, um I suppose now, like a lot of people know my background, that I, I have some health problems that which mean that the last 10 years have kind of been a rehearsal for lockdown for me in certain ways. Like at certain times a year, I don't go out as much because the cold weather affects me or the risk of catching flu for somebody. I mean, the only difference now is I don't get to socialize, you know, but certainly Monday to Friday, apart from the odd escape where I'd, you know, I'd, I'd have to go out for something, it would be quite similar to lockdown. So right. you know, that was certainly uh, a, a kind of experience. So I, I found like that in a lot of way, the my artistic world is based around some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. And I, I started to sort of consider the body um, and specifically my own, like a lot of people around me were saying to me, you know, you should, you know, it's almost that, that cliche of, you know, start thinking about what you know and what you understand. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a situation where, you know, you spend a lot of time with yourself and, you know, you're, you're kind of conscious of your own health experience. Mm -hmm. So when I started the MA, then I started to, you know, to talk to Francis and to Sarah and, you know, to get advice from them. And they, they were recommending publications and things were coming. And one of the books that I found certainly initially informed my thinking was um, the book, uh, The Phenomenology of Illness by Javi Carell. Mm. And, and very specifically, there's a line. And I think that this was like almost a window into, you know, where I was going is this idea that the healthy body is transparent. And I've, I've read some other stuff and this is a common theme is that, in, especially when people write about health and creativity and physical health was something that people wrote about less. But the idea was that you don't necessarily see your own body when it's functioning within what you would consider to be normal parameters. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't notice um, something till take, literally it kind of stops working or, or you know, you know, it's impaired in some manner. And so I, I think as an artist, I was both experiencing this and making art about it at the same time. You know, and I was, I was looking at, at the ideas of my own experience of my own body, I, Francis described as the compromised body, mm. about how, how that then appears in art, you know, and for me, like, you know, the, the paintings I've done, I, I have, I can, sh I think I can share the screen. Yeah, hopefully so. Um, let's see. If I can figure out, here we go. Sure. Um, if I look at this one, can you see this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, in, so, in some ways, uh, this, this painting um, is about a medical procedure um, called a bronchoscopy, where a camera is inserted into your lungs and you're given a, a type of medication which um, is called conscious sedation. Mm -hmm. So they sedate you where you're responsive to instructions, but ultimately afterwards you can't remember. And the, the purpose of it is they have to insert a camera into your lung. And you can't, this can't be done without sort of compliance because you have to be able to call for breed in a certain way so that you, um, you know, so that they can get the camera in without doing any damage. And I, while I was lying in the, on the, the bed getting this done, there was, like something that seemed like a smoke detector above my head and I had a green light on it. And I said to myself, I, 
you know, I want, it wasn't the first time I'd had this, so I'd experienced it, but I wanted to understand the experience. And I was looking at the green light and I said, you know, I'll try and focus on that as I, as I go out, so to speak. And there's just a moment where I was looking at that and then it was three hours later. Right. And so I began to think that, that there's a weird brutality to um, the, um, hold on, I just stopped. To, to illness like that, that often um, there's, I, I don't know how would you would express it, almost like an interference or, you know, uh, something that in, impresses upon you that you can't quite function in the same way and that things, you know, you, you give over to a certain vulnerability. I don't know if, if that's, if I'm, I'm being clear about that, that, you know, no, when I teams think are, are, I think there's an act of kind of violence. Yeah. 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 But, but there's also to a certain extent, a compliance, you know, I, I just, in my thesis, I describe uh, like sometimes illness as a wound, as almost like a, a whole body wound, if you understand. Mm. And there, there was things about identifying the body then in this, in this new condition, you know, and a, a lot of the writing talks about the, the, the muteness of the body and the, the quietness of the healthy body and how you know illness brings it into focus you know and and Carell also talks about a thing and you know the certain my experiences like as you said uh, you know uh, being friends with Morris and stuff and communications we had there was the idea that how serious illness informs what you do whether or not you want it to so you know, I was looking at not just the physical thing where you can no longer maybe, you know, stand for four or five hours and paint, but also does it become your subject? And even if you, you don't choose it to be your subject, is it like an underlying, is there an underlying sense that, you know, you're creating it from that point of view? You know, for me, there was a lot of changes I had to make. I couldn't, you know, paint for so long. I couldn't work with certain materials because of a, condition you know the, the danger that they would irritate me or you know affect my health you know I, I'd done a lot of etching and I had to give that up for a long time I mean ultimately now they have safe etch so it's possible to do that mm -hmm. so I was experiencing these while trying to to think about how I would express it and so it became like almost self-informing mm -hmm. you know where I was writing a thesis and the, the experience that I was writing about was the experience I was having writing the thesis. You know, so at times I was talking about how illness informs your practice while I was in bed ill writing about illness informing your practice. Mm. And so it it sort of came to like the, the paintings that I have there, I suppose the, the raw and immediate and sometimes that's of a necessity, you know, where you have to, um, you have a limited energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the, my, myself and uh, Morris had a, a joke that said, we're simultaneously an iPhone and a Nokia. Is that if we're at a hundred percent in the morning, we'll be at thirty percent by lunchtime. Mm -hmm. But then like the Nokia, when we get down to three percent, we can last for two or three days just just <laughs> just rolling along, you know. Mm -hmm. And that that became the thing that, you know, you, you there's a certain amount of management and both in expectation and in, you know, capacity to do things. Mm. And one of the things I suppose now looking at the exhibition, because I think now I'm the only person who's in the exhibition, mainly because of geographical reasons, I haven't actually physically been in the space. Right. I haven't been in NCAD for, I think it's on the three days short of a year. I think the 1st of March was the last time I was in NCAD last year. Yeah, that's a radical thing to think about, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And it, it's kind of that, you know, where something becomes, you know, something informs everything you do. Mm -hmm. And how do you negotiate that? I mean, I read there is a, this, a book, as Sarah recommended me, um, Feminist Queer Crip, where um, Kafer talks about the idea of projecting your body as a body into a space mm. and they said that 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 you people kind of do this if you get up in the morning and you want to go somewhere you kind of have to make a plan 
you know, I have to get into the car, I have to get on the bus. And they said, then when you get into incidents of illness, it becomes sort of more complicated, you know, is that you literally have to examine all possibilities. And again, in my thesis, I talk about the idea of if you're going to a particular building and um, you have to consider, is there a lift in that building and, and which stairs there are in that building? If the lift isn't working, how do I negotiate that? What decisions you make, you know, mm -hmm. is, is there going to be, you know, things like if you go to a shopping center, is there going to be a candle shop, which I can't go near because the, the chemicals irritate my lungs. If I go to somebody's house, do they smoke? Can I ask them in advance to make sure there's no candles in their house and not to smoke? Mm. And these all kind of sort of inform like an experience of going out into the world. And I, I think I was trying to find that in my art was, you know, just to reflect that. So in a lot of ways, I was exploring a kind of inner world of experience. Yeah, I, 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 I'm I, super curious. Thank you. Thank you so much for articulating it so well. Um, in terms of medium, so you were talking about, you know, the idea that you write poetry as well, but yeah. painting is your medium and you were talking about etching and and even the physical challenges of that. And I'm just, I'm interested in that idea of like um, the experiential nature of ill health yeah. And um, how that's, you know, how, how you're inscribing your body in relation to what you're producing. So I'm kind of interested in um, why painting, why etching? Are there other ways in which you could work? Or is this really, does this just feel like a really solid instinctive medium or is it worth the physical struggle of, um, because it, it's quite physically demanding, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, for somebody who can, could potentially articulate it in some other way, or is there something about that, about the inscription of that um, bodily engagement in the painting? I'm just, uh, that's a curiosity, I suppose. Yeah, that's it. That's interesting. Cause, like in some ways I can only sort of describe the painting as almost compulsive. Yeah. I feel I have, I mean, you know, I, I was one of these children that used to tear up the colored cornflake boxes and, and get a borrow. You have just to have something Somewhere, to yeah. write upon. So it, it always seemed natural. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I always think like, I said, I play music and I write poetry. They seem like extensions of it. Okay. So, so when I make a painting and I put a title on them, to me, the painting is a poem and the title is the first line. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like that. I mean, they kind of a little bit, there's a lot of crossover for me and mm -hmm. they're all expressions of it, a particular part, but also of a whole. And like, for instance, I paint with acrylics, mm -hmm. you know, exclusively with acrylics because they dry quicker. So I can, um, I can, I can work, you know, at a certain pace. Mm -hmm. My studio is in the house. So it's set up constantly, the paint is there, it's often I go in and the brushes are destroyed and they're dried because I've left them. But it means that I don't have to physically go somewhere, spend a particular amount of time and come back again, I suppose projecting the body, is that because it's within the home, I can get out of bed whatever time I get up, I can work for 10 minutes and go and rest if mm -hmm. that's the condition of my health, or I can work for a couple of hours if my health is like that because it's not a consistent thing you know I do get flare-ups of yeah. illness where I would be weaker I'd have less oxygen capacity and be more prone to tiredness mm -hmm. so there's a real tendency to you know in having this kind of flexible space so I suppose in that way again it's an inner world but it's also a space that I now control you know in a temporal way that you know I can I can sit on the couch and watch some rubbish on Netflix for two hours and then have a little bounce up, go work on the painting mm. you know, for 20 minutes and then go and you know, have a coffee and sit down. And... Mm -mm -mm. Um, okay, so, so just given the idea that we talked about the interest in poetry and language, could you talk to me about the titles of the work? That would be interesting. Yeah, the titles, um, funny enough, the, the, the three paintings that are included, two of them are, are about events that happened about four hours apart. Right. One is a, an event that happened a few years ago, but they're all actual events that happened and they're all about 
again, I think slightly the brutality of the medical experience. Um, the, the first one, the painting, that's, uh, again, I can bring it up. Sure, yeah. Share screen. Okay. Um, I'll just minimize this one. And maybe this is kind of, this one might be central. Yeah. yeah. The, this painting is called A Stranger Receiving Bad News. Okay. And on the, on the day that I had the bronchoscopy, as I was um, basically coming out of um, the anesthetic and you're incredibly groggy and incredibly like, you know, sort of detached from the world. But I did hear a conversation where somebody was being told that they potentially had like some serious medical issues. And I, I, I overheard this in the sort of fog of illness. You know, they'd been in for a, a similar procedure as I had, but you know, it was it was this kind of strange vulnerability of this man who was there on his own being told mm -hmm. that, you know, potentially he had a serious medical condition that may need, you know, very serious treatment. So, you know, it's it's a very direct almost a uh, title, you know, stranger receiving bad news because I didn't know who he was. I, I barely saw him, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you sort of carry that away with you because I've no idea, you know, what has transpired, you know? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in that titling of that was simply that. Now the next one is, um, this one is conscious sedation, green light, which is again the story that, yeah. you know, and so this would have been about four hours earlier. Yeah, yeah. was that experience of you know, disappearing specifically because there's a slight, slightly traumatic experience in having the camera put into your lung rather than into your stomach, for instance, although both are serious processes, having it into your lung, it, your body is very reactive against it. So the sedation erases your memory of it. Mm. And that, that's quite strange because, you know, you have these, these weird dreamless windows. But like I know from Sandra telling me is I wouldn't shut up talking during the, the thing. So, you know, you're, you're sort of weirdly lucid, mm. but you've no recollection. I mean, it's always fingers crossed that you don't say something that is wholly embarrassing, but, <laughs> you know. No, for sure. I think people talk about that a lot, right? That idea of anesthesia and, yeah. and both kind of waking dreams and yeah. Yeah, but that's thing you, you you have zero recollection of it. So it's you know it's a kind of strange thing to know something has occurred, but to have no memory of it. Mm. You know, so it's almost like there's a little, you know, a little erased bit. Mm. And then let's see the third one. Um And um, this, this is called heart tracing, which is basically when you're, um, you know, attached to ECG. And it was an experience I had where um, I, two weeks after my father died of a heart attack and two weeks after it, um, I, I got a little bit ill. I, I, there was a sort of stressful situation. It was post, you know, grief. And I began to have you know, quite unpleasant symptoms of how I felt. And at the time, um, my mother was staying with us in the house, you know, so it was post, there was a lot of grief. My parents had been married for 58 years and I began to get quite worried about my own health. So my neighbor had to drive me to uh, the local hospital where, you know, they were checking my chest because I was suffering from chest pains and stuff. And it turned out that, um, through this distress and the trauma that I damaged a thing called interstitial muscle muscles, wow. which are which are the muscles between your chest wall and your heart. So it wasn't my heart, but it manifested as chest pain. Mm. And so it was this experience of lying in a, a hospital room at night on my own with, you know, the same thing as I'd seen my father about two weeks earlier attached to and you know, thinking, am I having the same experience? And, and also, you know, you, you make the joke to yourself, I'm not so young anymore that this would be unusual. 
you know and then like that you know there was a lot of emotional baggage because you know obviously like leaving my mother and Sandra here in the house when I when I had to go and mm. not knowing you know what the coming experience was I mean ultimately as I said there was muscle damage that that manifests almost like a heart attack so mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. again it was that when I talk about that thing of of experiencing your own body like very much up close very much in a raw way you know that you know it's right there in your face absolutely no there's an incredible like um expressiveness and a kind of um a, an amazing short cut to exactly those those kind of scenarios in the work yeah. I'm, I'm curious about uh the relationship to painting and aesthetics in general like what the color palette is fairly consistent between the three what yeah. uh, does that change over time with you or is that a particular palette in relation to I mean obviously it looks in a way blood red and and yeah. kind of visceral in relation to the body but could you talk us through the palette a bit yeah that, that's interesting I mean like an honest assessment sometimes is that I you know if whatever paint is near me sometimes I'll use mm-hmm. I, I'm not um very strict with color okay. so I have three reds you're and very so consistent with color though <laughs> yeah yeah but but I think I find I mean the way like for me the process of painting is I get the painting done in whatever crude manner it is mm-hmm. and then I work back into it you know I keep working working until almost like I'm correcting my own work so in, in that Thing, there, there are certain images that will have on my head and so the red might come out and it feels appropriate and sometimes you know I think it's it's like what Shannon said earlier you know when you know the thing pops like that where you go this feels right and this is working mm-hmm. so I mean if I was to do that painting and leave it where like there are multiple layers of color and I'll constantly change the colors until the right one comes or I'll stand back from it and I say this feels like it should be more red and yes, yeah, so when you're dealing with medical stuff, the sense of of blood, mm. I think was there. Sometimes it's almost subliminal, you know, but it's kind of, yeah, it's almost like it's necessary mm. that if the painting won't be done until it ends up that color. Yeah, you know? it sounds to me like you've absolutely found your language, you know, yeah. I mean, the fact that you don't doubt it and that you work so yeah. kind of viscerally and instinctively means that to me that you're, you're not questioning that, like that's that's your language. And, yeah, and, and something I'd say about that, just when doing the MA, even though it was kind of very academic, you know, and it wasn't practice driven, has been a catalyst into me finding this language, interestingly. Yeah, it, it was almost like it gave me a, a chance to like to shed some scales and so the having the academic sort of experience, mm. I came back. I mean, all these paintings have been done, like for the most part in 2021. You mm. know that, mm. you know, coming back into that and feeling, feeling sort of free. Yeah, absolutely, and that's awesome to hear because that's exactly the point, right? Of these yeah, yeah. exploration. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, but also how to totally inscribe, worked, yeah. yeah, and how to inscribe yourself within art history or the language yeah. of painting or what might influence you or what what wouldn't or how you define yourself against it and and um i think that's just really exciting yeah that that's part of the armature you know what that is but you also know what you want to say yeah um yeah yeah thank you so much yeah thank you very much really great okay so i've blown the timeline as i said (laughs) we're half an hour late but i really enjoyed it um so i'm really happy if there's any uh, questions or Anne, you can also jump in now to see how we round this up this is your ending period so you've waited for quite a w- long time to I suppose uh, I don't know put a full stop to something that you've either one year or two years most of you so yeah, it must be a relief really, this felt like year four, three <laughs> this felt like year three I think <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, another year. Like, you know. Time doesn't mean anything anymore, right? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, like not to not to forget it or discredit it, but like the point that you get to celebrate it becomes a point then that you get to push, push on from it, you know? And like I think masters are the funny things because I 
think the end of the masters is always a starting point or something like that you know it's you just get to that conclusion where you kind of figured something out and then you get to go on so like that's the that's the nice feeling I think I've gotten from all this experience really mm-hmm. so it feels good yeah <laughs> absolutely um there was one point uh through our group discussions over zoom when we were planning the exhibition and we kind of veered towards okay well let's just start a collective and put forward apl- applications for funding for future projects and it was like after a hiatus of little communication uh and seemingly the end of a master's here we are trying to start a brand new thing going again so it is the ending but it's also the beginning of something else and that's really exciting absolutely i guess it, it has been Sorry. a reluctant mirage as well then. <laughs> sure sure <laughs> yeah yeah just the alpine brendan you know you're walking towards the horizon and you can see trees and water and then when you get there they're actually there <laughs> <laughs> that's true just hold on everybody yeah. they are actually there yeah. yeah okay maybe we'll finish there we all obviously want to thank annie for her time and obviously everybody everybody's participation but particularly annie thanks for you know saying yes <laughs> No, it was a great um, pleasure. I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I just think, yeah, I mean, I did a, an MA later in life after sort of thinking I'd figured everything out and it was the most rewarding thing. And I agree, it's exactly that moment of thinking, um, I want to refine my voice. I want to find my voice. You know, it's that moment, bringing all the learning that you've had already to the table. And then, uh, you know, it it should trigger a whole a whole new set of possibilities. So I think awesome and congratulations for doing it and um the future is bright okay that sounds like a good point to end on everybody congratulations thank you